Now the time has come, and so therefore, from the University of uh, Alberta, we have Professor Randy Gable of the Department of Computing Science. Now, uh, he will be speaking online. Please, Professor Gable. Konnichiwa. Um, uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to make this short presentation um, on what I've uh, titled Three Challenges in Translating AI Science to Application. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I want to acknowledge the incredible amount of extra work it takes Nikai and the conference organizers to organize presentations that span the world's time zones and still put them all in a package that you can listen to. I am a foundational AI uh, researcher who wor has worked as a public scientist at a Canadian university for many years. Um, and I want you to think about the cartoon I have in front of you, which uh, alleges that the cars are both autonomous systems and that the one driven or ridden in by the policeman um, has made some decision to pull over the car of the citizen in front of him. Um, and, and there's some profound underlying concepts here. Um, one is that um, the cars are autonomous, but they are not inspectable by humans. I want to say as a, a basic AI scientist, I would be disappointed if the results of our science are only human level intelligence. I aspire, unlike deep learning people, aspire to higher forms of intelligence and understanding them but I'll say more later. Um, the outline of my brief presentation uh, really has um, three components. I want to give you the Canadian context for AI research. Um, you'll hear something from uh, Element AI after me. I wanna say a little bit about the gap between AI theory and application and about areas where confusion can arise about the translation of AI theory into practice. I have to say that in looking over the speakers list for the Nika AI Applied Summit, um, I am increasingly impressed by the growth in uh, Japanese AI entrepreneurial activity. Um, my stay in living in Japan was many years ago when I was a professor at University of Tokyo and working with Fujitsu and working with the fifth generation computer systems project. And I've seen a dramatic increase in activity, perhaps partly due to the popularity of AI. Then I'll say something about three initiatives in the gap, um, in this gap between theory and practice. And to highlight some of the things that while some companies have claimed uh, have, as having solved those problems, the problems are not solved, neither theoretically nor practically. So let's keep going. Um, it's unusual for a Canadian to do what I'm doing. I did this the last time I gave an invited talk in Japan, but I wanted to summarize for this audience, which is slightly different than the academic audience, is that there have been a number of national strategies announced, which are public announcements by federal governments about investments in AI in this list, the first one made was the Pan-Canadian AI strategy in 2017. I haven't followed up in what happened in 2019 yet, um, but you can see that many of the players are on here, including Asian players like Korea, Japan, and China. Um, in Canada, you've already heard a brief, um, I think recorded address from Yoshio Benjo, if you were listening to that earlier today, but in Canada, the Pan-Canadian strategy is administered by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, which allocates money. In this case, it divides 125 million over five years at these three institutes. Amy, the one I started in Edmonton, the Vector Institute in Toronto, Waterloo, and at Montreal, um, the University of De Montréal and uh, McGill, um, where Yeshua Benjo is at. It's very important when you look at this small investment of 125 million uh, to note that in Canada, we do not have the industrial infrastructure of Japan. 
So the investment here is in the training of graduate students to increase the capacity of people able to apply AI in industry. So for example, at uh, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, we have um, uh, about a constant level of about 120 graduate students. Um, and every year we graduate some of those as PhDs and masters. So that's the Canadian landscape. Um, this is also un-Canadian to advertise and make claims about um, quality and assessment. I will acknowledge like everybody who studies how to rank things that you can always find a ranking that makes yourself look good. This ranking is not to make Canada look good, although we have, um, we have three, our three institutes are in the top 20 uh, worldwide. Um, the point here is about how quickly the gap between science and application can be filled when the gap between the volume of people you need is addressed with the investments seen here. So for example, maybe the most important part of this slide is that while Alberta has been demoted from rank two to rank three by Tsinghua University is Chinese investments in the national program has helped Tsinghua move from number 10 to number two in just a matter of a few years. That's important. Um, and in that gap, as I'll say more in a moment, um, Canadians feel particularly uncomfortable living next to such a huge influential country as such as the United States. But this statement by Eric Schmidt, who used to be the chairman of, of Alphabet, reveals an anxiety that the public AI scientist doesn't like very much. And that is, it reveals that politics has entered into something because of the incredible anticipation of value from artificial intelligence and its applications. And I'll say more about that um, uh, in a second. And that's a good segue to the gap and what's happening in between. So one of the things that I think is very important um, is the following. Um, the, the gap can be accelerated as in many computer science uh, applications from science to engineering to application uh, because much of the gap is filled with software. That is the construction of interesting and novel software that solves a business problem that accelerates from the theoretical side of, of the science of artificial intelligence. Um, I believe that there's a, a, a significant overselling of AI science that colors those ideas. It also creates the, the politics in the gap. So I've heard companies make presentations which on the face of what they claim should mean I should give up as an as a AI scientist because the problems have all been solved. Of course, the problems have not all been solved. Um, another part of this is just about who seems to control investments and direction in the gap. A recent book by an American, Amy Webb, called The Big Nine, identifies two groups which are interesting clusters. Um, I would hope that SoftBank is in there somewhere, but she didn't put it in there. G Mafia is as listed, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and IBM. Um, and BAT is Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. It should probably include um, uh, SoftBank. Um, the point about that is that um, the translation and investment in translation of AI science to AI application seems under that hypothesis concentrated on those big companies. That is those nine or the big nine G mafia and bat. I don't think that's healthy, frankly, myself from an AI scientist point of view. The second thing is that it's only recently, I don't have assessments of data um, uh, for Japan or for Canada or for Europe or for the United Kingdom, but about 2016, the overall investment in AI research at universities, both public and private, um, was surpassed in private funding, public funding. So for example, the G Mafia, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, and others invest more money in university AI research than any of the public organizations, including National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and other public mechanisms in the United States. So that's a very important thing to observe. And I, I would guess that it's worth paying attention to in Japan. J 
Japanese Science and Technology Agency, for example, might want to consider how that trajectory is going. Oops. So now let me briefly say something about um, accelerating translation, which is dangerous. Um, the, um, uh, given a longer talk, I would show you a video about intelligent drones being developed by um, DHL in Europe, by, by Google and by Amazon for autonomous delivery of packages. In that video, the claim is that uh, the, the deployment of those drones is at least two to three years away and it has nothing to do with technology. It has to do to the fact that the drone technologies accelerate past the legislative regulation. And that will be a, a, a sort of a constant theme of my presentation is that in the translation of AI science to AI applications, one has to be increasingly aware of legislative regulation for so many different reasons. I actually think this audience will know a lot about that because all of the Japanese entrepreneurs trying to deploy AI will somehow face um, some kind of regulatory compliance. Um, I want to point out to some examples. So for example, deep learning applied to medicine and to legal information like Ken Sato at, at NII does faces uh, the confirmation of, of, for example, medical compliance. If you look at the paper from this year in January of Garrett Rees on the, and his colleagues from DeepMind and University College London, in the, even in the abstract, it notes that the best they do with the data that they've looked at is to produce two thirds false positives in predicting um, imminent kidney failure. That's simply as we know, for any of you who have any connection to clinicians, an impossible number. Um, no clinician would rely on a prediction, which is two thirds false positives, thereby um, uh, risking patient safety and security and lifestyle by treating them for something which uh, two thirds of the time doesn't obtain. Um, I'll say a bit about face recognition. Um, it's a pretty good example of how the acceleration and translation has created um, what are culturally observed to be dual use. Um, the last one I want to point out is, is that um, the, um, the, the uh, open AI corporation funded by Tesla um, has, has got a lot of attention by claiming that their AI systems for managing the generation of language um, are so good that they're dangerous to use. It's really kind of funny because some of the simplest natural language problems, for example, in this case, Asana wants a Lamborghini, but we don't know which one. Um, some of the simplest natural language problems are not solved by this one 175 billion attribute trained model. So we are a long way away from understanding language. Um, the, the dual use can be of, of some of these technologies is pretty evident in the use of face recognition. Um, and uh, the two examples I have are not surprisingly from China. So if you can use um, high resolution face recognition to pay for your Kentucky Fried Chicken by a smile um, is, is maybe a positive application of face recognition in the consumer space. Of course, um, the Americans um, are, are quick to politicize the use of face recognition to target um, um, individual populations. Um, just to note that the Americans do exactly the same thing. They have the highest rate of incarceration of visible minorities on our planet, uh, bar none, more than, more than China and India with the two biggest populations. Yet those two things show positive and perhaps um, 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 morally challenged application of AI and the quality of the AI is not at dispute. It's the quality and it's the issue of application. So those are part of the things that are taking on in that gap, part of the things we should be wary of, which I'm sure you've heard from a few others at this. This last slide in the area of the gap I wanted to highlight someone, for example, the former longtime director of IBM Tokyo Research said something at a Japanese AI Society meeting last year that within two years, 
80 to 90 percent of all applications will include include deep learning models. So the acceleration of the use of some AI technologies is more rapid than we think. The chart on the right is uh, you needn't study. In fact, these slides will be available. I've passed them on. But the idea is only that there is an incredible infusion of, of AI and machine learning into almost all industrial software. Um, now, I wanna talk about three initiatives in that gap, having given you the big picture of some of the challenges between um, science on one side and the translation to application on the other side. The first is, is the notion of autonomy as end-to-end -end deep learning or not. So while you watch this video, and if you read the literature and look at the claims of one of the first autonomous driving um, companies that is Waymo spun out of Google in the Alphabet group. There are others, um, Tesla, Uber, um, Drive AI, and a few others exist in the United States. And it's in advertising videos like this that they demonstrate the use of their autonomous vehicles who have driven um, uh, with their sensors, if you like, capturing all data and using that data to be able to build control systems. So you can see that the environment in which this car operates is that uh, this, this one seems to be just close to the um, uh, Menlo Park or Mountain View Park, Mountain View headquarters of Google. Now I want, I want you to contrast this and the suggestion that end-to-end -end learning can control all of these systems with this, which I've enabled the sound because I want you to the reality, as I said earlier, is that I am the kind of AI scientist that is highly skeptical of the broad deployment of deep learning and its, its promotion as the solution to the AI problem because we already know that humans do better in learning how to drive. Um, this is a very busy slide, but one of the things you might notice that a guy named Hermann Wiener um, who is a civil engineer faculty member at University of Darmstadt in Germany, is, is a very vocal um, critic of the end-to-end -end learning of control systems for autonomous driving. Um, he, with three big manufacturers that I've spoken to, Volkswagen, Toyota, and Nissan, do not believe that there is any such thing as an end-to-end -end learning of driving. Even in this slide is, is that average humans learn how to drive way within the bounds of the claims made by, by Waymo, for example. So there's something going on here about the intelligent use of data that is not captured by the current deep learning systems. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later because the big auto manufacturers are not building end-to-end -end control systems, but rather incrementally regulated safety systems added to driving. Now, I want to next talk about the second of the trade-offs in this, in this area. Um, and the second of the trade-offs is autonomous systems. Um, in the first demonstration of end-to-end uh, -end autonomous driving was made by Audi Q5 in Shanghai using 5G networks. So the complements of the infrastructure and the autonomy um, intelligence was a necessary trade-off. Um, one of the things people have talked about, this is a picture of a traffic circle in my hometown. You can't learn how to use it without reading the, the Alberta Safety Traffic Act. That is, if you learn to navigate by driving, you will fail because you'll have too many accidents. Um, the, the French roundabouts are my favorite because here um, you have to learn that the rules are different than the ones in Alberta. Now, the last thing to speak about is explainability. And I've used this explanation for how to assemble a piece of Ikea furniture because I wanted to quickly convey the idea is that you need a representation that humans understand, but that is in this case, language agnostic. You already know that whether the explanation is useful is determined by whether or not you assemble the piece of furniture. Now the last three slides are, are largely in deference to my Japanese colleagues. 
um, and how to solve the automated decision-making explanation problem, for example, from GDPR. So how do you do that? Well, you build representations here that at least are augmenting the control features you may learn by deep learning. So here's one from someone that is collaboration between Japan and Italy. That is, you have to build a representation of a deep learning system that transforms to rules that cover what the deep learning system is. And you can use the rules to explain how a decision was reached. Um, there's another kind, this one comes from Oshawa at University of Tokyo, is in identifying trends in the behavior of deep learned uh, mechanisms, you're identifying what you might call qualitative curation. And the last slide is really about the revival of the old fifth generation systems projects. So there are now emerging inductive logic programming um, systems which take deep learned examples and transform them to rules to be able to use those in explanation to be able to get a positive instance of an application of AI. So I'm not going to say much more. I think I've used up my time. And um, thanks for listening to this short presentation. I always encourage you to uh, write to me and ask me questions about this. And of course, I will share the slides. The bottom line is the translation of AI um, is going faster, but creating more challenges along the way. That is trust, regulation, ethics. You've seen that. The classical application to autonomous systems is revealing new challenges and that one should not believe that deep learning is the, uh, is the path towards autonomous driving. And finally, for humans, we need to build systems that augment their representations for both us as humans receiving explanations, but also in the integration and composition of software to be able to have the declaration and interaction between software components about um, explaining um, predictions. Thank you. Professor Gable, thank you very much.